Part 4. The Battle of Concord 17. Luke's eyes snapped open. He awoke to the smell of cooking eggs and the sound of a wailing siren. Becky rushed into the room, her eyes wild. She was already dressed in jeans and a T-shirt. She held a spatula in one hand. That's the general alarm. We have to go to City Hall. Okay. Luke sat up and pulled on his boots as she turned and scurried back into the kitchen. She was back a few seconds later holding a sandwich and his car keys. Here, you eat this, she said, pushing a bacon sandwich into his hand. I'll drive. Becky didn't really give him a choice, so he went with the flow, hoping that she knew what she was doing. He followed her through the front door and out to the car. The Mustang's V8 roared to life as he circled around to his door. He had barely sat down and closed it before she took off with a squeal of rubber. He had to hold on to the dash with his good hand as she took the few turns at speed and then hammered it down Green Street before pulling up hard in front of the City Hall building. Luke was a little shaky as she turned off the car and handed him the keys. You've done this before? She smiled and nodded. My grandparents had an old bomb we were allowed to drive around their farm. Yours goes better, she said, grinning, before jumping out. A sizable crowd had already gathered. Becky got lots of whistles and claps as she led him up the steps and into the city hall building. The lobby was abuzz with motion as people ran this way and that. Goose, said Becky, grabbing a skinny kid with glasses as he rushed by. What's going on? There's an army coming, he said, before shaking her off and heading off on his previously charted course. Come on, she said. Bowman must be back. Luke had to rush to keep up with her as she took the steps up to Randall's floor two at a time. His door was open and crowded with uniformed men. Bowman was front and center with Colonel Randall. The older man acknowledged Becky and Luke with a nod as Bowman continued. Their army is 3,000 strong and led by three tanks. I think they'll come in by the most direct route, he said, running his finger along the 90 to Albany and then northeast along the 202 to Concord. They're big enough that they won't bother trying to sneak in via small roads. Randall's lowered brows almost covered his eyes as he looked down on the map. "'If I may, sir?' asked Bowman. Randall waved him on. "'They're too big to fight, sir. I think you should make a treaty with them, or we should find a place that we'll be able to defend better.' Randall turned his gaze on the soldier. "'I appreciate your candor, son, but neither of those options are on the table. This is our home. We made it, and we'll defend it.' As for making a treaty with them, submit or die is not a way to treaty with anyone, nor is sending tanks and an army of 3,000-odd a serious attempt at diplomacy. No, we have only one course of action, and all I would ask is that you have faith. He looked around at the rest of the people in the room. Bowman nodded, as did a few others. Are you with me? Randall asked in a gravelly voice. A chorus of yes, sir, went around the room. Good. Let's start planning, then. First off, this is where we'll attack them. Randall jabbed his thick finger onto the map near a little town called Hillsboro. There is a forest on either side of this corridor. This Fox State Forest is perfect for an ambush. It's close to the road and is bound to be even closer after all these years of unhindered growth. I want to situate a small team here. Bowman, you'll lead. No more than thirty men with automatic weapons and rocket launchers. The aim will be to take out the tanks. Besides sheer numbers, that's their main advantage over us. I want those tanks blown off their treads as soon as possible. There will be blowback, but you should be able to suppress their response with automatic fire long enough. Don't engage too long before you retreat. The second team of five will be here, he said jamming a finger at the map on the 202 in front of Penelope and John Dawson Memorial Forest. I want a flammable barrier set up across the road. The forests on either side will have grown thick and close enough to the road by now that will light up a thousand acres of woodland on both sides from that one point. As soon as you're safely through, light it up. He looked around at them, his eyes shining like a school kid showing off a Christmas present. He won't stop them but it will slow them down and keep them on the 202. They won't risk trying to skirt the fires. It would only leave them open for more ambushes. Once the fire is well ablaze, fall back to this spot. 
On the map, he pointed to a river. That's the Contecook River, and the 202 goes right over it. A two-lane bridge. On this side, he said, pointing to the eastern side. We'll set another barricade, and we'll position the bulk of our army on the road with more in the trees to hopefully thin out their ranks some more. So the idea, said Luke, is to thin their ranks so it's a fairer fight when they get to Concord? No, the ambush should sap their resolve some. I want to stop them before they get anywhere near Concord. Right now, I think he has some grand plan about rolling into town and throwing down his ultimatum, which of course he thinks we would accept, given his overwhelming force. He won't be expecting a punch, let alone a fight. We'll give him a whole flurry of punches and put him on the canvas before he even reaches the outer suburbs of Concord. Sounds like a great plan, said Becky. There were nods of agreement around the table. Even Bowman looked convinced. Don't get me wrong, said Randall. This will be tough, and lots of people will die. Ours and theirs. But with a bit of luck, we might just manage to pull through with our city and our freedom intact. Randall then took a few minutes to give his senior soldiers their directions. Within minutes, the room had cleared. Now, we have a bit of housekeeping to attend to, said the colonel. We need to send your friends in the robes a request for backup. It should be an easy sell, because if we fall, they fall too, eventually. Do you have anyone in Manchester you can send? I have just the person. I'm not sure the Brotherhood will come, but I guess it's worth a shot. Hmm. On second thought, I might send someone too. A uniform, and they can take a Hummer. Perhaps that will add some weight to the request. Sounds good. Good. You organize that when you get back. We need to move quickly on this. I'll send my person to you by 1,200 hours. Now, what about these marauder characters? Isaac told me he has some sort of connection with them. Is it worth reaching out to them? I have a use for them. Sure, I'll get on that too. Right. Now, I'm pretty sure they'll be concentrating their efforts on Concord, but there is a possibility they'll split their attention between us and you in Manchester. If Manchester falls... They have a way to come at us from the rear. So I want you to keep all your people in the team I stationed down there. Protect that bridge at all costs. That's where I think they'll come at you. Luke nodded seriously. The nervous excitement of the news Bowman had brought was wearing off. Fear began to creep into his belly. Fear not for him, but for Aaron and the rest of his people. Surely the life they were just beginning to rebuild wasn't to be snatched away so quickly. I should go, he said. Okay, son. Luke walked out of the room and Becky followed him. They paused outside the door of the office and a little to the left, out of sight of the people in the room. Luke faced Becky and took her by the hand. Sorry I have to go so abruptly. I had a really great time last night, he said. I hope we can do it again sometime when this is over. Me too. I had an awesome time, and I'll hold you to it. They looked at each other awkwardly for a second. Then Luke took the plunge and leaned down, kissing her on the lips. She kissed him back, a lingering kiss that only ended when Bowman emerged from the room. Oops, sorry, he said as he went downstairs to the lobby. It's okay, said Luke, interested that for once it was Becky blushing and not him. He knew what the answer to his next question would be, but thought he'd ask anyway. Did you want to come back to Manchester with me? It might be safer. She shook her head. No, my place is here. For now, anyway. Sorry. Don't be sorry. I understand. Well, I'm out of here. I'll come and see you as soon as it's over. Luke really put the Mustang through its paces on the way home. Time was of the essence, and he wasn't shy about pushing her to give everything she had. After a quick debrief with Isaac and the rest of the council, they nominated Paul to be the emissary to the Brotherhood in Portland. Isaac thought there would be more weight to a written missive and quickly went to work drafting something on behalf of both cities. Isaac also sent Jamal to let Randall's Concord contingent know the situation and pass on his order to guard the bridge at all costs. Randall's nominated emissary to the Brotherhood arrived in a Hummer just before midday. They recognized the soldier from Drake Mountain but didn't know his name. He looked only a few years younger than Colonel Randall himself and walked with a limp. 
I'm John Lockwood, he said, shaking Luke and Isaac's hands. Isaac was impressed with Randall's strategic thinking. Except for Simon and the other prisoners who had been released, Lockwood would be older than anyone the brothers had seen in a long time. His presence would lend an even greater air of authority to the situation. This is Paul, said Isaac as Paul came rushing down the steps, looking a little flustered. Hi, said Paul, shaking the older man's hand. You have the letter? Isaac asked. Paul reached into his jacket and pulled the folded paper out a little for the others to see. Luke spent a few minutes giving them a briefing on what they might expect from the brothers before they said their goodbyes. Isaac and Luke watched the Hummer go. How long do you think it will take them? asked Isaac. Driving? A little over three hours is my guess, depending on the condition of the roads. I reckon it was probably an hour and a half drive back in the old days. Oh, good. I thought it would be longer. Do you think they'll help? I honestly don't know, said Luke. But I have a feeling we're going to need everyone we can get. Speaking of, do you fancy a ride to Ashland? I think one of us needs to be here, said Isaac. Too much to do. What if I go? I'm the one who made a deal with them after the last encounter. I can take Ben with me while you continue organizing things around here. Do you want to take the Mustang? Luke asked. If it's okay with you. Luke looked doubtful, but Isaac couldn't tell if he was joking or not. Do I need to remind you that it was me that drove the truck that saved our asses all those years ago when you wouldn't? Luke grinned. No, dude, you don't need to remind me. But I also remember the state of that truck by the time we dumped it. They both laughed, and Luke pulled the keys out of his pocket and dropped them into Isaac's open hand. Just don't scratch it, okay? You sure you have to go? asked Indigo, back in their room. Can't you send Ben on his own or with one of the others? Isaac shook his head and put his hand on her arm. Sorry, Indy. I think I need to do this, and the sooner I go, the sooner I'll be back. She looked like she might argue some more, but finally nodded. Okay. But please, be careful, she said, pulling him into a tender hug. Two hours later, Isaac and Ben were cruising past a little town called Tilton on the 93 on their way to Ashland, the base of the Marauders. They were both lost in their individual thoughts. Isaac was thinking about worst-case scenarios and their best course of action if Concord was to fall. Stay and fight to their almost certain death, or once again flee. Ben was thinking about more personal things. The love bug had bitten him hard, and he barely gave the impending attack a second's thought. He was head over heels in love with Diana, and as the countryside whizzed by, was imagining getting down on bended knee and asking her to marry him. They were both jerked abruptly from their thoughts when, without warning, Ben's window exploded. 18. Paul was quiet on the run to Portland, Maine. Truth be told, he was a little intimidated by both the big lieutenant and their mission. For his part, Lieutenant Lockwood tried a few times to make small talk, but clearly the kid wasn't in the mood for speaking. He let him be and concentrated on his driving. He was unarmed except for his sidearm, but wore a Kevlar vest under his fatigues. The briefing from Luke before they left was short and sweet. He hadn't used the exact words, but the main messages he had taken from it were religious nutbags, unpredictable, and possibly sporting a deadly grudge. Great. His passenger fell asleep about fifteen minutes out of their destination, and Lockwood let him sleep right up till they were crossing the Four River and heading into the city proper. Hey, kid, he said, nudging him with an elbow. It took a second nudge before Paul finally stirred and looked around groggily. We're just entering Portland City. Look alive. Okay, said Paul, pulling off his glasses and cleaning them with his jacket. They saw the first buildings of Portland a short time after, and their first robed brother a few minutes later. The man was an odd sight in a brown monk's habit and walking a big black Labrador. He looked at them, his mouth dropping open when he saw the gray hair of the uniform-clad soldier driving the army vehicle. They watched the man run into a big building. Lockwood slowed the Hummer down to fifteen miles per hour. He wanted to give the inhabitants plenty of time to get used to the idea they had some visitors before they reached the city center. 
Not long after, they heard bells begin to ring, and Paul spied men running this way and that between buildings. Lockwood slowed the Hummer even more as they turned onto Congress Street and pulled to a complete stop when faced with a roadblock fifty yards further on. In the distance, they could see the big building the brothers had made their headquarters. Oh, jeez, whispered Paul. Behind the barrier, a large group had gathered. The majority were robed in brown with a spattering of black robes amongst them. To a man, they were armed to the teeth, and several long guns, both shotguns and rifles, were trained on them. Don't sweat it, kid. Reach under your seat and pull me out that white flag, will you? Without taking his eyes off the danger ahead, Paul reached under his seat and felt around blindly until his fingers found a smooth length of wood. He pulled it out and handed it to Lockwood. Randall's man held up a hand and slowly began stepping out of the vehicle. As an afterthought, he looked back into the Hummer and smiled at Paul. The kid was white as a sheet and had a sheen of perspiration on his forehead. Relax, kid. You look as nervous as a cat shitting a razor blade. The rat-a-tat-tat of automatic gunfire buffeted the door like an invisible giant's hand. Paul screamed and ducked. Glass sprayed and Lockwood grimaced in pain as bullets struck his back. The handle of the makeshift white flag slipped from the soldier's unconscious fingers onto the driver's seat as he fell to the roadway. Paul heard shouting and a cry of pain as the gunfire ceased as abruptly as it had begun. His breath came in small, panicked pants as an ominous silence fell over the street. In front of City Hall back in Concord, Bowman and his thirty men were assembled and ready to head out. By dark, they would be ensconced on the edges of the Fox State Forest. Equipment-wise, they had three rocket launchers, every man had a pistol, and those not carrying launchers were armed with an assortment of Chinese and U.S. Army automatic weapons. Bowman and his second in charge, the newly promoted Lieutenant Saracen, had already given a briefing on the location of their ambush and the plan of attack. Bowman almost felt the waves of excitement coming off his men. The romantic allure that battle had for young men never faded, and this group was no different. He had no doubt their emotions would be quite different in a day's time. It had been close enough to twenty-four hours since he and Gunnarsson had parted ways and it was clear the kid had gotten into trouble. He shrugged off the worry. It wasn't something he could afford to think about right now. He heard murmurs amongst the men and looked back up the steps to City Hall. Randall was coming for his final pep talk. He nodded to Randall as he took his place in front of the men. Men, you have an important task in front of you today. Today you're marching to become the first line of defense for our little community. Make no mistake, this will be a difficult challenge. We didn't invite this fight on our doorstep. So have faith that right is on your side. He paused before going on. It's quite possible that some of you, a lot of you even, won't come back. But remember why we're doing this. Your families your friends, your city. This enemy offers only death or subjugation. We'll give them death in return because the other is not an option for the people of Concord. That's all. Good luck. The men returned his salute and broke up to gather their gear. The colonel turned to Bowman and saluted. All the best, son. Remember, have your men lay down withering fire to allow the rocket launchers to do their thing. Fall back only after you take out the tanks, but don't take stupid risks. Yes, sir. We'll see you at the river. Twenty minutes later, Bowman and his men were crammed into the one five-ton troop carrier that the people of Concord possessed and were heading for their ambush site. Isaac jerked the wheel in shock, and the Mustang veered dangerously to the right, then back to the left as he struggled to bring it under control without braking. If someone was shooting at them, there was no way he was going to stop until they were out of range. What the hell was that? Ben didn't answer, and when Isaac turned, he saw his friend's head lolling on his chest, his body slack and only held up by the seatbelt. Ben! He put his foot down harder on the gas and tried to wake Ben by shaking his arm. The Englishman didn't stir. He could see no blood or wound. Please be okay, said Isaac. 
He pulled the car over five minutes later in an area he could see for miles in each direction and jumped out, running around the bend side of the car. There was a large, irregular-shaped hole in the shattered glass of the window, with shaking hands and dread threatening to overwhelm him. Isaac pulled the passenger side door open. Blood flowed from a wound on Ben's scalp. It seeped through his hair, down over his ear and onto his neck. Isaac could see right away it wasn't a bullet wound. Thank God, he whispered, and gently pushed Ben back against the seat so that his head rolled back onto the headrest. He felt for and found a pulse in Ben's wrist and saw a fist-sized rock on the floor between the seat and the door. It looked like a river stone smooth and shaped a little like an egg. They hadn't been shot at. It had probably just been some nasty, feral kid who heard their car coming and took the opportunity to create some mischief. He slapped Ben lightly on the cheeks. Ben, can you hear me? Ben! His friend began to stir, his slack face immediately transforming into one of pain as he reached up. Isaac grabbed his wrist. Don't touch it, buddy. You got hit pretty good by the look of it. Ben's eyes fluttered open. Did I get shot? No, it was a rock. Luckily, the window probably took most of the velocity out of it, or it would have caved your head in. The Englishman winced as he straightened in his seat. I think it did. No, you'll have a pretty decent lump for a few days, but your head is definitely not caved in. Try not to move too much. I'll see if there's anything I can clean you off with. Isaac opened the trunk and found a square of towel that someone had torn off and used as an oil rag. It would have to do. That looks nice and sterile, said Ben when he saw the rag. Sarcasm is a good sign, said Isaac, as he began to dab away the blood on his friend's face and neck, then more gently into the hair and around his scalp wound. The blood looks like it's stopping. Here, just hold this against it for a while. Ben took the bunched-up towel and placed it gingerly against his head. Did you see who threw it? No, I was driving along lost in my thoughts one minute. The next thing I know, the window explodes. How do you feel? Okay, I guess. My head is throbbing, and I feel a little woozy. But I should be okay. Do you want to turn around and go home? No, let's keep going. We can't afford to lose the time. Okay. They were back on the move a few minutes later. Try not to go to sleep, said Isaac. He had heard you shouldn't sleep straight after a concussion somewhere in the before days. My head hurts too much to sleep, said Ben. 19. They arrived in Ashland 20 minutes later and parked the car a short walk out of town, parking it in the driveway of an abandoned home. For both, walking into the town itself was an eye-opening experience. If Concord was the benchmark for an ordered and neat city in post-apocalyptic America, Ashland was the opposite. There was no doubt in its time it had been a postcard-perfect little New England town. Now, though, it was a disheveled, dirty, and overcrowded village. People were everywhere in the center of town. There were kids running around with no shirts on, women selling items from stalls that lined the main street. They even walked by a girl who was no older than sixteen suckling a baby as she sat on the sidewalk. There was an unpleasant smell in the air, a toxic combination of raw sewage, rotting food, and dead animals. The two strangers barely warranted a look until they were spotted by a group of armed men sitting in the shade of what Isaac took to be a bar or saloon. The men sauntered across from where they were lazing around and blocked the two strangers from walking any further. Who the hell are you? asked the bigger of the three, eyeing Ben's matted hair and bloody shirt. He was bald with a crude cross tattooed on both of his cheeks. Isaac looked him in the eye and drew himself up to his full six-foot-one-inch height, careful to keep his hands relaxed and by his side. I'm Isaac Race. This is Ben. We're from Manchester. We're here to talk to Jared. Oh, I remember you. Ash handed your ass to you before your big friend with the pirate hook killed him. Yeah, that's me. Is Jared around? For a moment, Isaac thought the big guy might give them some more lip, but after weighing him up for a few moments, seemed to change his mind. Follow me. 
They walked through the town and headed into a school on the outskirts. The buildings and grounds of the school were less disordered than the rest of the town, and it seemed to be almost exclusively populated by men. To Ben, the schoolyard looked like a prison yard. Tough-looking men stood around talking or lifting weights or throwing a ball. The only obvious difference was the weapons that lay around all over the place. Swords, pistols, rifles, even a battle axe. Seen Jared? The big guy asked two men playing cards at a table after they entered the main doors of the school's reception area. He's in a gym playing b-ball, said one without looking up. They went through the building and into the adjoining gym where two teams were facing off in what came across as a pretty brutal game of basketball. A compact, fit-looking man took a shot and sunk the ball as they walked down the side of the court. Isaac recognized him as the one they'd come to see. Jared, someone to see you. Mid-celebratory fist pump, the man turned around and his eyes widened slightly. Take five, he said to the other players on the court and then jogged over, wiping his face with a small towel he had tucked into his shorts. Isaac, he said, holding out his hand. Isaac shook it. This is Ben. What happened to you? It wasn't my men, was it? He asked, glaring at the big man who had escorted them in. No, said Isaac. Call it a random act of violence. I'm okay, though. I just need to clean up, said Ben. I can fix you up with a shirt, said Jared. No, that's okay. I'll clean up when we get home. The marauder's leader shrugged. Suit yourself he said, and turned to Isaac. So why the visit? The three months you gave us is up, and I was going to come and see you in a week or two. I think most of the group have changed their mind about joining up with you, but we were going to take a vote. Isaac looked around. Everyone in the gym was watching them. I wasn't really here to talk about that, but we can kill two birds with one stone. Have you got somewhere private we can talk? Sure. My office. Come on. So you want our help to fight them? A killer army of 3,000? Yes, said Isaac. I know you're probably wondering why you should risk your people when their fight's not with you. You could say that. Well, the thing is, they won't stop. They've already taken all the old New York State and parts of Vermont. They won't stop until the rest is under their control. If they get conquered, New Hampshire will fall. That includes Ashland. Well, lucky for you, my boys are spoiling for a fight. We did what you asked and stopped our raiding, but I know for a fact they'd love to stomp this army. How many men do you have? Ben asked. We had over 800 fighters when we marched on Manchester. It's more like 400 now. A lot of people went their own way once Ash was gone. Isaac was disappointed. He had been hoping for at least six hundred. He kept his face neutral and nodded. That would be great. How soon can you march? Jared thought about it for a moment. We could start preparation this afternoon and march first thing in the morning. Isaac started to do some calculations in his head. That means you'll get there late tomorrow afternoon. You don't have any vehicles? Oh, sure we do. But there's no gas left. It'll have to do. Isaac said. The colonel had estimated the army from Rochester would pass by the Fox State Forest the next day at around midday. Hopefully the ambush and then the blockade on the bridge would stop them, because it didn't leave a lot of time for the marauders or the Brotherhood to arrive and be deployed, but there was no other option. He stood up and shook Jared's hand. Thanks. I'll make sure the colonel is expecting you. Good luck. You too. Let's kick some ass. 20. In Portland, Paul lay curled up on his seat and desperately tried to think of a way out of his situation. It was useless, though. Panic had set in, and his usually quick brain refused to work. You're surrounded. Drop your weapon and come out of the vehicle, a deep voice called. I'm not armed, Paul yelled in what he hoped was a confident voice. He reached over and grabbed the white flag and held it up over his head, waving it side to side. We came to talk. Sorry about your friend. The man who did that will be punished. 
You can come out. I guarantee your safety, but step out of the vehicle slowly. Paul took a deep breath. He half thought it might just be a trick to get him to show himself, but another part of his brain said they could just as easily have shot up the Hummer. He sat up with both hands in the air, one still holding the makeshift white flag. He winced, half expecting a hail of bullets, but they didn't come. A few of the men had come closer to the Hummer. There were four of them, and they all wore black robes. Two of them had guns trained on him. It's okay, come out, said one of the unarmed ones. Paul shuffled over to the door, still with his hands up, and opened it with his elbow before stepping out onto the road. That was when he heard a moan from the other side of the Hummer. He looked through the Humvee's cabin and saw Lockwood's hand reach up and grab the bottom of his doorframe. Paul looked at the unarmed black robe who was approaching. He had a kind face. Do you mind if I check on Lu my friend? Yes, all right, but come around the front of the vehicle. No sudden moves. Paul walked around the Hummer as fast as he dared. He barely took any notice of the four brothers that had closed to within three yards. He was focused on Lockwood, a man he thought was dead until seconds before. He rounded the door and fell to his knees near the groaning man. Lockwood was still face down. A line of three bullet holes stitched the back of his shirt from his right hip to his left shoulder. Strangely, there was no blood. Paul helped to turn him over as the four brothers arrived and stood over them. Lockwood's eyes were dazed, but he looked well and truly alive. You're okay? Yeah, I'm okay, he said pinching the thickness of the Kevlar vest under his shirt. Lockwood looked up at the brothers who were looking down at him in wonderment. You guys sure know how to put on a welcome. I'm glad you were wearing a vest, said the one with a kindly face. Here, let me help you up. He reached down and grasped Lockwood's wrist. Rest assured, Elder, the man that did this will be disciplined, said another as he was pulled to his feet. No hard feelings said Lockwood. May I ask where you are from and why you are here? asked the kind-faced one. We're from a little town called Concord in New Hampshire. We're here to ask a favor. Ah, Concord, he said, looking at the other brothers. We've heard of you. Come, we will hear of this favor. First, you will sup with us. Paul doubted he would have gotten this far if he'd come on his own. The fact that Lockwood really was old in their eyes did help, just as Isaac had said it would. He thought Lockwood might beg off because time really was of the essence, but in the end he said they would be honored to join them for a meal. Before eating, Lockwood was taken to be treated for the bruising on his back, and Paul handed his letter over to the senior brothers. In the clinic, Paul sucked in a breath when he saw the large welts on Lockwood's back. For some reason, he had always assumed the bullets would bounce off of Kevlar as they did off Superman. Son, said Lockwood, as he downed the painkillers offered to him by the physician, a kid barely older than twenty. Looks bad, but not half as bad as it would if I'd not been wearing that vest. They ate a hearty lunchtime meal with what appeared to be all of the black-robed senior brothers, and barely two hours after they arrived were brought before the three white-robed members of the council. Lockwood gestured that Paul should take over now. Clearing his throat, the younger man stood up and faced the council. We are of the cities Manchester and Concord in New Hampshire. We know of the Brotherhood through the people of Williton Green, who now reside with us. There were murmurings around the room before the black-robed speaker knocked his staff on the ground three times. The casualties that day were unavoidable. We later released the surviving brothers and allowed them to travel home to you. One of the men in white stood up. We acknowledge that the treatment of the Willet and Green people was unjust and instigated by a brother who has been banished, although he has not returned. Brother Simon returned and told us of you and your mercy. I have read the letter you carried to us. 
You want our help to fight a battle? Yes, sir. A large army marches upon the people of Concord and Manchester. It numbers at least three thousand and is well armed. Our leaders have asked us to come and seek your assistance. To fight a war we are not involved in? asked the middle white robe. Yes, sir. The army is very aggressive, and they won't stop until they reach the East Coast. Their motto is submit or die. If our two cities are defeated, there is nothing left between you and them. Paul went on to relay the information that Isaac and Luke had asked him to pass on. He pulled no punches and emphasized the barbarity of the way New America conquered territories. Our leader requests that you send a fighting force to Concord. In return, he wishes to open trading with you. Assuming the war is won, of course. Yes, sir. Allow us to confer. The white robes disappeared through a door at the back of the room. A young man that neither Paul nor Lockwood recognized came over. I'm Brother Simon, he said. Oh, you're the one who Luke and Isaac let go, said Paul. Yes, I was humbled by their kindness. Do you think your council will decide to help? I don't speak for the council. You put forward a good case, so I hope they do, because it doesn't sound like this new America will stop at Concord. They didn't have long to wait. The council returned after a few minutes. We have our answer. We have unanimously decided to send a fighting force of three hundred men to assist you in resisting this army. The rest of our forces will stay here in Portland to protect our territory. If God is willing, we will have victory over these barbarians and can then sit down in the spirit of cooperation with your cities. Thank you, sir, said Paul. You won't regret it. An hour later, Paul and Lockwood were on the way back home. That went surprisingly well, said Lockwood. You mean apart from you getting shot? The soldier laughed and then winced immediately. Yeah, apart from that. That part sucked. They were headed back to Concord with a commitment from the Brotherhood to send 300 troops. They would depart that very evening. 21. Cyclops had started out life as a kid from the wrong side of the tracks in Chicago. He often wondered if he'd still be alive if China hadn't attacked the U.S. He'd been 14 when that shit went down, and already a big, man-sized kid who'd been drawn into gang life. The answer to that what-if question was, he'd almost certainly have been dead or in prison. Now, here he was, six or so years later, leading a troop of five hundred men into battle. He and his contingent had crossed the Merrimack well south of Manchester via Raymond Wichurik Drive, two hours before, and were now holed up in the Manchester-Boston Regional Airport. The report given to Orton by Eshman had indicated that four of the bridges over the Merrimack and Manchester and within the northern and southern limits had been barricaded or destroyed. The only one left crossable was, according to their reports at the time, lightly guarded, but it would also be an easy rallying point for the enemy. Orton had devised a plan to cross onto the eastern side further south and attack Manchester from the south and the east. Station yourself in this airport, Orton had said, pointing to the Manchester-Boston Regional Airport on the map. Separate into two units and head out at dawn attacking from the east and one from the south. Have 350 men attack from the south while you and a team head in from the east. Leave Khan in charge of the bigger force, but have them hold off while you try and negotiate. I want you to head to the tower. Eshman thinks it will be hard to defend and that they won't be inclined to risk their women and children when faced with a decent-sized armed force. Offer them terms, but smash them if they resist. After Manchester is taken care of, I want you to head north to Concord and attack at will. We'll be coming from the west. 
Cyclops, who had captured William Orton all those years ago, still resented the fact that Orton had risen through the ranks to become general. He hid it well, though sometimes when on the end of a tongue-lashing from the blonde general, he wished he'd shot him in the face back then. Still, he did respect Orton, the way a burglar respects a dangerous Rottweiler. Perhaps his patience was to be rewarded, though. As they were leaving the briefing, Orton had pulled him aside and made him an offer. A dangerous offer, but one with a big payday. Cyclops agreed to it, but he also knew that Orton had handed him power by just making the proposal to kill the president. He would play along for now, and when the time came, he would be the one to decide whether President Riley or General William Orton lived to see the triumphant end of the battle for Concord. Isaac and Ben beat Paul back to Concord to tell Colonel Randall about the commitment from the marauders. Isaac was impressed by the cool but determined attitude of the Concord people. Their team for the ambush had already left, and when they arrived, Randall was busy organizing his remaining forces into two contingents, one to seal off the bridge, the other a defensive failsafe should they not halt the progress of the new Americans. "'Will you command from Concord?' asked Isaac. "'No, son. I'll be holding the line at the bridge. If your marauders and the Brotherhood do show up, the Brotherhood will bolster the defense of Concord.' "'And the marauders?' "'Well, from what you've told me, the marauders are the more ruthless fighters, and it sounds like they're spoiling for a fight. I have a plan for them.' "'Okay. Well, they should be here sometime tomorrow. I hope it's soon enough.' "'It'll have to be,' said Randall. "'My man Saracen will be in command of the forces here when the Brotherhood arrives. "'Are you sure you don't want us to send anyone?' "'No,' the older man said, shaking his head. "'You're in just as much danger as us. "'You look after your neck of the woods and keep them off our tails. "'While they might not have any military expertise on their side, "'I have the feeling Aiden Riley is no dummy and might split his forces. "'Our best advantage lies in attacking them before they get here. "'They won't be expecting that. Isaac and Ben said their goodbyes and left for Manchester. Paul and Lockwood arrived in Concord barely ten minutes after the other two had left. The Brotherhood were the ones that Randall had doubted would come to the party, and he was extremely happy when Lockwood reported they would be. "'That's fantastic news,' said Randall, clapping him on the back, causing him to wince and double over. "'Sorry, Lockie. What's wrong?' "'He got shot,' blurted Paul feeling a little bit like a kid trying to talk with the adults at a barbecue. He cringed when Randall turned his intense gaze on him. What? It's okay, Colonel. I was wearing my vest. One of their boys got a little trigger-happy and tried to ventilate me, but I'm okay. Show me, said Randall. Paul edged behind Randall to have a look, too. Lockwood turned around and lifted up his shirt. The mottled green and purple welts that marked the impact zones of the bullets had spread and merged at their perimeters, almost covering the soldier's back. They gave me some painkillers, but I won't be wrestling anyone for a few days. Right. I've got just the job for you. I have something planned for these marauders, and I need someone with experience to pull it off. Come to see me off. I'll give you my instructions while we walk. The two men left his office and Paul stood where he was, unsure if he should follow. By the time he decided he should, he felt like it was too late to do so without looking like an idiot. That's when the decision was taken out of his hands. The pretty, dark-haired girl who had seen them into the office poked her head through the door and smiled at him. Don't you think you should go with them? Oh, sure, said Paul, attempting to sound nonchalant as he headed past the smiling Becky with his face burning. He caught up with Lockwood and Randall as they headed out the main doors. "'Ah, Paul,' said Randall. "'Lockie was just telling me what a big help you were with the Brotherhood. Would I be able to convince you to stay and help him? You'd be his aide-de-camp until all this is settled.' "'Yes, for sure, sir. I'd love to.' "'You sure the people back home won't mind?' "'Well, I, I think my sister would be fine with it, and I know she'll be looked after by Isaac and the rest. So yes, I think it'll be fine.' "'Excellent.' So, I was just telling Lockie. 22. 
Even though the wind whistled through the broken passenger side window of the Mustang the whole journey back from Ashland, it was only halfway back to Manchester from Concord that Isaac remembered it. Oh, crap. Luke is going to kill me. Ben laughed. I'm sure it won't come to that, but he is in for quite a nasty surprise. When they rolled up to the tower ten minutes later, Luke was, of course, the first one down the steps to greet them. He cradled Aaron in his good hand as he took the steps two at a time, holding her out in the Superman position. "'There's Uncle Ben,' he said, and Ben rushed over, cooing as he took his niece in his arms. "'Whoa, what happened to you?' said Luke, the smile on his face fading when he saw the crusted blood on Ben's shirt. His eyes widened when he looked at the car and saw the jagged glass around the window and realized it wasn't just down. Isaac came around the front of the car. Sorry, Luke. Dude, his friend said, shaking his head ruefully. You had one job. Isaac looked at the ground. I know. It's fine, man. I'm just messing with you, Luke said, lightly punching him in the shoulder. What the hell happened, though? Ben looks like he went ten rounds with Edward Scissorhands. Isaac and Ben explained everything after they'd gone inside and cleaned up. They also informed the council of the latest news from Concord. So, it's really happening? said Indigo. Afraid so, said Isaac. The good news is we have an experienced military commander on our side and a fair-sized contingent of soldiers here in Manchester. Do you think they'll attack us? Well, it's hard to say for sure, but I don't think so. I think the colonel is giving them too much credit. I think they're itching to roll right over Concord. If it was them the night Ben and Diana got shot at, I think they would have seen that we don't pose much of a threat. Luke wasn't so sure, and he didn't think Isaac believed it 100% either. His reasoning seemed to make everybody else feel better, though, so he kept his mouth shut. Their core group spent a peaceful few hours eating and talking together before everyone went to bed. Bowman and half his men made a clearing and set up camp about fifty yards into the forest. The other half were sent to work on the edge of the forest, digging light trenches and building hidey holes. The trees wouldn't offer much cover once the shooting began, but it would definitely keep them out of sight until they chose to start the party. It was hard work once the sun had gone down, but after a few hours they had achieved what they had wanted. Three hours earlier, they had left the smaller team behind to begin building the combustible barricade. Everything was in place. It was now just a matter of timing the retreat right. He would need to engage the enemy enough to stop them in their tracks and thin them out before he and his team made a hurried retreat along the forest edge and back to the barricade. It sounded easy enough, but Bowman knew there was a very good chance that he and a lot of his men could die when the new American army finally rolled through. His last task before bedding down was to send his fastest man, a skinny kid called Lachlan, on foot to wait on the western edge of the forest. He was to run back as soon as the enemy army was sighted. If the new Americans were traveling as slowly as they had been when he'd spied them two days before, the men would have plenty of time to get back and raise the warning. A three-man team took the first watch and he bedded down for the night in a flattened area of grass under a pine tree. That night, for the first time in a long time, Daniel Bowman dreamed of his parents. Isaac's eyes snapped open. It was still dark. He needed to whiz, but knew if he got up to relieve himself, he wouldn't get back to sleep. In the end, his restlessness was disturbing Indigo, so he got up anyway. After visiting the bathroom, he felt wide awake and decided he'd go up to the roof and get some fresh air. He snuck out of the room as quietly as he could and headed up the stairs. When he stepped out onto the roof, he took a surprised step backwards. Someone else was up there leaning over the rail and looking to the west. As his eyes adjusted to the darkness, he recognized the familiar figure. Luke, you scared the hell out of me. His friend turned from the rail as he walked over. Sorry, I couldn't sleep. Worried about what's coming? Luke thought for a second, then nodded. 
Yeah. From what Bowman was saying, this army makes the marauders and the Brotherhood together look like a Boy Scout troop. Guess it doesn't help that Becky is still in Concord, too. His friend turned away and grasped the rail again. Is it that obvious? Isaac nodded. You should go get her tomorrow. Between me, Ben, and Indigo, I'm sure we can look after Aaron. Nah, she won't come. The sense of duty and all. Isaac put his hand on Luke's shoulder. Then you go to her. Maybe. Just to make sure they're all prepared. Then I'll come back. Okay. Sounds good. They talked about the possible outcome of the confrontation west of Concord for a little longer, and then Luke said goodnight and went back downstairs. Isaac stayed a while, looking up at the stars like he used to before his parents died. It seemed so long ago now that it was almost like someone else's life. He wondered what they'd think of the man he'd become. He remembered them being genuine and pragmatic people and decided they'd probably be quite proud of him. He went back downstairs, feeling a little sad, but also at peace. He fell asleep quickly. 23. After breakfast, Isaac and Jamal walked Luke out to the Mustang. Jamal had a screwdriver and brush to take the trim off the door and clear away the broken glass. I think I can replace the glass in your door, said Jamal. We just need to find a similar age Mustang somewhere. It would be good to have one for parts anyway, but we can start with the glass. If you can manage to do that, Luke said, I'll have to give you 50% ownership. Jamal laughed. <laughs> no need to go that far. I'll be satisfied with taking it for a spin once a month. From the corner of his eye, Luke saw Jamal jerk violently backwards. He was still smiling as he turned, wondering what his friend was doing. The crack of a rifle reached his ear a millisecond later. That was when his brain caught up with the data his senses were relaying. Jamal lay unmoving and staring into the sky. There was a hole in his chest and an obscene red spatter painting the concrete around him a terrible red snow angel. Luke fell to his knees, trying to scream. Nothing came out but a gasp. Suddenly hands were on him, and Isaac was pulling him up by the shoulders of his jacket, dragging him towards the cover of the car. Sobs racked Luke's chest as they fell to their knees. Jamal! He tried to get back up. Isaac pulled him back down. Luke shook him off and tried again. We have to, we have to help him. Isaac knew his friend was in shock and pulled him into a bear hug. The shooter was still out there. There's nothing we can do for him, Luke, he said quietly and urgently, gripping him as tight as possible. His eyes caught movement over Luke's shoulder, and he spotted people inside the tower coming to the plate glass windows. Isaac waved frantically, shooing them away from the window. He heard muffled shouts and screams as they realized the danger they were in. That didn't matter. What did matter was that someone in there took charge and appeared to be ushering them back from danger. Not ten seconds later, the general alarm started to sound. I, w I was just talking to him, said Luke. We were... he was... I know, buddy. Luke, I need you to focus. The shooter is still out there. Luke nodded, sniffling, and wiped his eyes with the sleeve of his jacket and pulled away from Isaac's embrace. What direction was it from? he said putting his head up a little to look through the broken window of the Mustang. Three hundred yards to the left, he could see the sentries at the gate were nowhere to be seen. From the east, from across Elm Street, Jamal had been hit directly in the chest and thrown backwards. It had come from the buildings directly east of them. How the hell are we going to get out of this? said Luke, unable to prevent himself looking back at Jamal's body. Isaac warily rose to his knees next to Luke, and looked across Elm Street through the glass on the driver's side. Luke's hand grabbed his wrist. Movement. Luke was right. At first he didn't see, but then from the shadows between the buildings, he saw soldiers in black began to emerge into the daylight. Lots of them. They gathered slowly on the sidewalk on the other side of Elm Street, quiet and well organized. One stepped forward, a big guy with a shaved head and an eye patch. 
he put a bullhorn to his mouth. We're here in the name of New America, he said, and a cheer went up from the soldiers around him. We claim the old city of Manchester and demand that you surrender to us. While he spoke, Isaac and Luke looked at each other. Luke looked angry enough to go and take them on himself. In fact, as the bald man finished his spiel, Luke began to stand up. Isaac grabbed his arm. Cool down. It won't help anyone if you get your head blown off. If you surrender, continued the new American, you will be welcomed as citizens of New America. Where are Randall's men? Luke said, frustrated. I don't know, but we're here and they're not. Let me do the talking, and I'll try to buy us some time. They might take another shot, said Luke. No, I don't think so. Killing Jamal was meant to shock us into submission. I have the feeling they would rather take us without a fight. He stood up before Luke could protest further. The men across the way twitched into life, and Isaac found himself facing at least a hundred guns. He put up his hands quickly. Keep those hands up, drawled the leader into the bullhorn and have the guy with you stand up. Luke rose and stuck the middle finger of his good hand up. There was a ripple of laughter from the new Americans at his petty defiance. They'd seen it all before. You put your hands up too, big guy. Screw you, said Luke, his fingers still up. Luke, hissed Isaac, just do it. We need to get back into the tower in one piece. Luke gritted his teeth and nodded before complying. Good. Now who are you? I'm Isaac Race. This is Luke. Where's your leader? We don't have one leader. A council governs here. I'm on it. A council? Well, how very democratic. So what do you say, councilman? Surrender or die? Well, that's the thing about councils. They have to vote on any decision as important as the one you're offering. The words were no sooner out of Isaac's mouth than distant gunfire and explosions sounded south, toward where Randall's men were stationed at the bridge. Well, it sounds like your army friends didn't take the deal. Maybe we should just shoot you down now and storm the building. Isaac's heart sank. He'd assumed this was all of them. With Randall's contingent engaged, they were on their own. No, please. Allow us to take a vote. It will literally take five minutes. The big man lowered his bullhorn and talked to the man next to him briefly, before raising it again. I'm a big believer in democracy myself, so I'll give you ten minutes. If you're not back out here when that ten minutes is up, though, we're turning that tower of yours into Swiss cheese. Okay, thank you. Ten minutes it is called Isaac. Come on, Luke, we don't have much time. We should take Jamal. Isaac nodded. They didn't really have the time, but it was the least they could do for their friend. Isaac took Jamal's shoulders, and Luke picked up his legs, pinning them under his arms. It was a struggle. Jamal was a solid guy and quite tall. They were both puffing with exertion by the time they got up to the doors. Tears sprang to Isaac's eyes as he heard the wails of grief behind the glass. Bastards, hissed Ben, as he helped them through the doors. Oh, poor Jamal, cried Indigo, as she comforted Allie and Ava, who was racked with grief. What do they want? The three boys lowered Jamal onto a bench seat, and Ben took his jacket off and put it over his face. They want us to submit or die. I told them we'd vote. We're going to vote? she asked. Hell no. We're going to fight. 24. Bowman and his team were fully prepped one hour after sunrise. He walked along the dugouts and hides where they nervously waited on the arrival of the enemy. He was by far the most senior person there and had to keep reminding himself that these soldiers had just been kids when the shit had hit the fan. The three men with the RPG-29 rocket launchers were spaced ten yards apart and about twenty feet behind the first line of trees. As soon as Bowman gave the word, they would step forward and position themselves at pre-designated trees 
ready to fire on his signal. They were all confident kids, and he was hopeful they could pull off accurate strikes before the return fire began. He gave each of them quick pep talks as he walked along. The tanks would be traveling one after the other because the road wasn't wide enough to accommodate two across. Each of the three would target a different tank. If you strike your designated tank, fire your next grenade at the car or at a different tank if your buddy has missed their shot. If you miss your designated tank, and I'm sure you won't, fire at it again. The rest of the men were fanned out either side of the rocket launchers. They would begin firing at will once the first salvo from the rocket launchers had been fired. Once he'd done all the talking he wished to do, Bowman sat down with his back against a tree and rested. His night's sleep on the rough ground had been sporadic at best, and he soon dozed off. He was awoken by a hand shaking his shoulder. Lachlan's back. They're coming. The rumbling sound and faint vibration under his body reiterated the warning. He grabbed his Kalashnikov and shot to his feet. Ready, everyone? he yelled. Yes, sir, came the excited responses. Remember, wait until all three are in view. They didn't have long to wait. Just three minutes after Bowman was awoken, the first tank growled around the last bend and into view. He saw the men around him tense in anticipation. The black-painted tank, with leaves and dust swirling in its wake, was quite a sight on that overgrown New England road. Hold, Bowman called as the second came into view. Then the third. Wait. The vibration from the three tanks was enough to make his guts quiver now. Finally, they were all directly in front. Fire! Like clockwork, the three men fired. The first man scored a direct hit on the turret of the first tank. It exploded and caught fire. Bowman saw from the twisted metal and odd angle of the turret that it had been damaged badly. It slowed and began to veer off the road towards the trees on the other side. Clearly, its operator was out of action. The second rocket-propelled grenade whizzed right past its target, the middle tank, and exploded in the same trees about to be bulldozed by the disabled tank. The third hit the last tank on its road wheels, damaging its track but not enough to stop it. Take a second shot, called Bowman as he began firing his Kalashnikov at the Mercedes. The driver had slammed on its brakes, and as its side windows exploded inward, immediately threw it into reverse and planted his foot. A horse rider behind the vehicle was quick enough to evade the car, another not so quick. His horse was struck in the legs and fell to the side, its rider screaming in agony as it rolled onto him. The rest of the horsemen were able to scatter aside, some of the riders even beginning to return fire as the Mercedes disappeared around the bend. Fire at will, screamed Bowman. Gunfire erupted around him. Horses and men shrieked. A second rocket-propelled grenade struck the third tank. This one hit the turret near the front and blew off its cannon. Amidst the chaos, Bowman saw the undamaged tank come to a jerking halt and the gun turret begin to turn their way. Mendelssohn, take another shot at that tank, he yelled, between bursts of fire from his Russian-made weapon. Mendelssohn's down, answered someone. Bowman cursed and risked a look. Mendelssohn was indeed down, half his head missing. A bullet whizzed by his ear as he saw Johnson, the first RPG guy, just completing a reload of his weapon and readying to turn it on the remaining tank. It would be a near thing. Bowman didn't bother ducking. He just kept firing at the horsemen and infantry that were now raining hot lead on his team, hoping against hope that Johnson was quicker on the draw than the guy in the tank. Nine miles away, Colonel John William Randall heard the faint sound of explosions on the wind. He was overseeing his men as they put the finishing touches on the last section of the barricade. He looked west, and it wasn't long before he saw black smoke low on the horizon. Okay, look alive, people. Bowman's team have engaged the enemy. Let's finish this barricade. On the conquered side of the bridge, half of his men had already been set in position in the thick brush on either side of the highway. Four hundred yards past the bridge, the rest were camped on the tarmac of the highway, protected by sandbagged barriers and machine gun nests. If the new Americans made it past the barrier, they would face a gauntlet of fire from either side of the highway and then be peppered from the men further down the highway, where he also had some other surprises up his sleeve. 
Randall went back to his command tent and poured himself a coffee before coming back out and looking westward again. One of his young lieutenants walked back from the bridge just as he was draining the last of the bitter liquid from his battered tin mug. They're done, sir, said Tim Byfield. Excellent, Tim. Had them put down their tools and give them some grub. Yes, sir. How long do you think before they come through? If everything goes according to plan, it'll be a few hours. We'll have a more accurate idea when those forests go up. Yes, sir. Randall stood a long time after Byfield left, looking at the smoke from the battle at the Fox State Forest. He'd planned so the casualties would be minimized, but was heavy with the knowledge that there were men dying over there right now in a battle he had no control over, a battle he'd sent them to. No matter how old one got, some things never got less painful. 25. With four minutes of the ten-minute count left, Isaac, Luke, Ben, Diana, and four other volunteers were headed to the fifth floor in the tower's one operational lift. Everyone else was being evacuated to the basement, with Indigo in charge. Ben carried the only rocket launcher they had in their possession, and the others, except for Isaac, carried an assortment of automatic weapons. When they had moved in, the fifth floor was where they had determined they had the best scope and vantage defending the tower. The roof of the twenty-story tower was too high for anything but sniping with a high-powered rifle. But from the fifth, where they had removed windows and welded in steel plates for protection north, south, and east, they would have the best range for automatic fire without being physically overwhelmed by an enemy force. The fifth floor was also where they had located their secret weapon. Luke had spotted it a week before in a storeroom at the military building where Randall's team was stationed. He'd insisted they bring it back and install it for the defense of the tower. So they had, even though Isaac had opposed it. At the time, it had seemed overkill to have a heavy rotary machine gun. Dude, we have to have this. It's an M134 minigun. Remember the old Predator movie with Arnie? This is the gun they went after the Predator with, although there's no way in real life you could carry it around like they were and operate it effectively. There's nothing mini about it. No, but this baby shoots thousands of rounds per minute. Isaac had still looked doubtful. Dude, I'm not shitting you. If there is even a remote possibility we'll be attacked, this thing might be the difference between winning and losing. This is not because you want to go all Arnie on me? Isaac asked. Luke laughed. I wish, he said. He held up his hook and gestured at the handles at the rear of the gun. It needs two hands to operate, so that'll be your job. I don't want it for a toy. Well... It kind of looks like the leaf blower my dad used to have me clean the yard with, so I guess it can't be that hard to use. <laughs> yes, dude, Luke had laughed. It shouldn't be any harder than that. When they got it back, Jamal had secured the pedestal of the heavy gun to the bare concrete floor with bolts. Luke had given Isaac some lessons, both dry firing and a quick burst of live rounds over the top of the buildings on the other side of Elm Street. It was easy to operate once he got used to keeping it level. Handles to maneuver, a switch to arm it, and two trigger buttons for his thumbs, low-rate trigger on the left and high-rate trigger on the right. Now, as they entered the stripped-out fifth floor with its missing windows and heard the sounds of the battle further down Elm Street, Isaac was more than glad he had let Luke talk him into it. How much longer? he asked as they headed to the windows. Luke pulled out the stopwatch he'd been carrying in his pocket since his stay at Old Orchard Beach. One minute, thirty seconds. Okay, stay low. I don't want them to know we're up here till we start firing. Are we waiting for the full count? Asked Luke, as Isaac grasped the handles of the M134. No, said Isaac, as he maneuvered the gun so it was aimed at the men on the other side of Elm Street. He hit the arm switch. The soldiers were spaced along the street front and appeared to be relaxed and talking amongst themselves, not even attempting to take cover. Clearly, they believed Isaac and his people would surrender. Isaac saw their commander check the watch on his wrist and then snap something at his men who came to attention. He stepped forward and raised the bullhorn to his mouth. Fire, whispered Isaac harshly. 
he pushed the low-rate trigger button. It turns out that Johnson was quicker on the trigger than the operator in the remaining tank. Unfortunately, call it pressure, or fate, or whatever you please, his shot went wild and zoomed past the front of the tank. It struck a horse that was trotting up the inside, its rider trying to sneak to the head of the column. The blast turned the animal and rider into a shower of ground meat that splattered a twenty-yard wide area. Oh, shit, said Bowman. Get down! He stayed where he was, peeking out from behind the big tree he had been resting against just minutes ago. The dark mouth of the cannon seemed to be aimed right at him. He couldn't tear his eyes away, let alone run. That was when the now weaponless and apparently driverless third tank crunched into the tank about to blast them, pushing it forward a good two yards. Its metal tracks chewed up the asphalt as it continued to motor forward against the resistance. Boom! The forest exploded ten yards to his left, sending bodies, dirt, and debris flying in all directions. The rest of his men continued to fire at the column, but the return fire was coming back heavier as more of the new Americans' infantry got into position. "'Leave none alive!' yelled someone he couldn't see behind the new Americans' line. Bowman squeezed off another burst of fire in that direction and was rewarded with a curse but no scream of pain. When the turret of the live tank began to crank back in his direction, he knew it was time to withdraw. Retreat, he yelled. Fall back! Inside the Mercedes, William Orton had stayed down and out of sight until the driver gave the all clear. When Orton put his head up, crumbs of glass fell out of his hair. A pale-faced Riley was upright, a wild look in his eyes. Riley's guard was slumped in his seat, blood seeping from a bullet hole in his right cheek. Next to him, Bull moaned, holding his bloody side. "'The assholes ambushed us,' said the president. As if to punctuate his point, another explosion rocked the tank that had been in front of them. Horses and men fell. That explosion seemed to spur Riley into action, and he grabbed the snub-nosed machine gun from his dead guard's hands and jumped out of the Mercedes. "'Come on, you sons of bitches!' he screamed at the men around him. They're in the trees! Attack! Riley led by example, shooting maniacally as he stomped forward in his business suit. The infantry, who had fallen back at the shock of the explosions and the initial onslaught of automatic fire, began to rally around their leader. Orton climbed out of the Mercedes, ignoring the dying bull's pleas for help, and made his way to the back of the car, careful to keep it between him and the enemy. He ducked when he heard the whoosh of another rocket-propelled grenade. This explosion was followed by thick, warm droplets of gore and blood raining down upon his head and shoulders. The surviving tank's gun boomed, and he heard the blast and screams of the enemy on the edges of the forest. Riley and around a hundred men were firing and slowly advancing. This wasn't to be the end after all. He stalked across to a young infantryman whose eyes widened at his bloody hair and face. "'Give me your gun.' The kid looked unsure. "'Now!' Orton snatched the gun and raced to join the new American troops who were now pressing home their advantage. "'Leave none alive!' he screamed. A burst of fire answered his call, and the soldier beside him went down with a groan. Another bullet zipped by his ear. Orton dropped to the ground back in survival mode as the men around him returned fire with renewed passion. A few seconds later, he heard the call of retreat in the distance and took his hands off his head, slowly climbing to his feet. He let off a few rounds for good measure but stayed low, always ensuring there was a man in front of him as they ran after the fleeing ambushers. He didn't see Riley come up beside him. The president's tie was askew and his suit scuffed with mud and blood. "'Sir, thank God you're all right.' "'Never been better,' answered Riley. "'There's something about facing death that makes one feel so alive, don't you think?' "'Yes,' said Orton. "'Maybe you could stay on your feet next time?' Riley said, with a knowing smile. He turned on his general and began walking after his men at a leisurely pace. Orton raised his gun and pointed it at the president's back. Men ran past him with more joining the pursuit each second. Too many witnesses. Not now, but soon, you asshole. Soon. 26. All too rarely in battle, 
Some plans work to perfection, almost as if the guy upstairs scripted it that way. For Isaac and his people, this was one of those occasions. The M134 began spitting 2,000 rounds per minute into the enemy soldiers across the plaza. The stream of death began in the middle of the line of men, and he swept the weapon left, mowing down every man he could see. The leader threw his bullhorn away and ducked behind a light pole as his men fell like ragged dominoes. Isaac hammered the power pole for a few seconds, his fire sending sparks flying off the wrought iron and spitting red dust from the bricks on the wall behind. Somehow the man remained standing and unscathed. Isaac swept the rotary machine gun back to the right, scything down the men who hadn't fled for cover and were now shooting back. The return fire pinged into the concrete around the windows, and one struck the ceiling over his head, dusting him with plaster. With the help of the others, Isaac managed to take down at least a hundred men. When his gun finally chewed through the four thousand rounds of ammo they'd loaded it with, the road and sidewalk were littered with broken bodies. Isaac's hands were numb from the vibrations of the gun. The leader had disappeared. Isaac released the weapon and sat back on his legs. He felt a little sick at what he'd just done, but was glad that it was he who had to bear the burden, not one of the others. Luke walked across to Isaac and held out his hand, pulling his friend to his feet. Good shooting, he said, his face serious. Come on, we need to mop up. Isaac nodded. Oh, well, I didn't get to fire the rocket launcher, said Ben as they turned from the windows. Perhaps I should... He didn't finish his sentence. The crack of a distant rifle sounded again. One of the volunteers, a twenty-year-old called Jeffrey Kalinsky, took a bullet in the back, the high-caliber round blowing out his sternum and throwing him to the cold floor like a rag doll. Everyone fell to the floor except Ben, who looked down at Kalinsky in horror. Ben! yelled Isaac. Get down! Diana reached up and grabbed her boyfriend's hand, pulling him to the floor. Isaac cursed himself for forgetting the danger of a long-range shot. I saw him. He's in the window of that tall gray building, said Diana. What window? asked Ben, getting to his knees and hefting the rocket launcher. His face was pale but angry. It was two down and three from the right. Right. Isaac, in a minute I'm going to need someone to distract the shooter so I can blow his ass out. Normally Ben trying to talk like a badass and messing it up so royally would have had Luke and Isaac in gales of laughter. But the situation was too serious. Just feet away, one of their own was dead, and the killer still had them in his or her sights. Okay, said Isaac. Go right to the far corner of the building and take your shot from that window. We'll distract them. Keep your head down. Like a hero in a movie, Ben leaned over and kissed Diana on the top of the head and then scurried to the southeastern corner of the building. When he was in place, he turned and gave the thumbs up from underneath the window. Luke looked at Isaac. How about I stand up in front of this window, then duck back down? Then you take a turn in front of yours. It should keep them interested while Ben does his thing. Okay, don't stay up too long. I'll go first. Count of three. One, two, three. Isaac hoped they weren't risking their lives for nothing. He knew Ben had been given training by the team Randall had placed in Manchester, but it would still have to be a lucky shot. Luke took a deep breath and got to his feet. He pretended he was looking for the sniper, then quickly moved to the side and nodded to Isaac. Isaac stood almost as soon as Luke was out of danger. He saw Ben was leaning against the sill with the launcher against his shoulder. He counted to three and stepped back from the window just as another round cut the air near his ear and struck the wall behind them on the western side. Whoomp! Ben fired. A split second later there was an explosion. They all watched Ben for a reaction. He was still in place at the window the smoking weapon at his shoulder. After a second, he slowly turned his head, a look of disbelief on his face. I think I caught them. Luke and Isaac risked a peek. On the other side of the square, a smoking black hole in the brickwork had swallowed the windows on either side. One of them happened to be the third window, two down from the top. Nice work, said Luke. Diana sprang to her feet and joined them at the window they were looking from. Yep. You got him, did I, Dick? She said to Ben as he approached. I beg your pardon? Diana laughed, took him in a warm embrace, and kissed him on the lips. It's just what my grandpa used to call a good shot. 
They could still hear gunfire south of the tower, which meant Randall's men were still fighting. Come on, said Isaac. We're going to need everyone who can carry a gun. A short time later, Luke and Isaac led around a hundred of their citizens out of the building. Half had guns, the rest anything they could find in the poorly stocked armory, swords, axes, baseball bats, even a slingshot or two. The remains of the new American force that had been sent to secure their surrender had fled. Isaac gathered his people around. I don't know how many there are, or how well armed. We have the element of surprise on our side, but we need to come up on them quietly. Follow our lead. Isaac and Luke led them down their side of Elm Street a hundred yards to avoid the dead new Americans before crossing to the other side and making their way quickly south towards the sounds of battle. Cyclops, once a boy named Deshaun Darnell Jordan, fell heavily to the ground. He had broken into a building a half mile down the road from where his men had just been massacred. He was bleeding out. From Isaac's vantage point, it had looked like none of the bullets had struck their target, but in fact, one had. High in the left arm, just below the shoulder. The wound was a ragged, bloody mess. Deshaun had tried to stem the blood from his nicked axillary artery, but had barely managed to slow it. And now, as he leaned his head back against a steel filing cabinet in an abandoned store's office, he felt a deep heaviness in his limbs and knew his time was up. So much for deciding who would lead New America. In the seconds before he died, he remembered his mammy on her deathbed. God has a special plan for all of us. We must be thankful for the part we play and head off stage quietly when our part's over. When his remaining eye glazed over a few minutes later, Deshaun's face was peaceful. 27. Bowman and the remains of his team ran through the forest, thirty yards deep but parallel to the Franklin Pierce Highway. He tried to count his men, but it was difficult. His best guess was fifteen. That meant he had lost half. There had been more when they began their retreat, but the enemy had done the unexpected, pursuing them on foot and shooting at their backs long enough for Bowman to fear that none of them would make it. Luckily, they were finally called off. Approximately twenty minutes after they began their retreat, they reached the roadblock that was to be set on fire. The men that Randall had stationed there emerged from the brush on either side of the road with their guns at the ready. Bowman ran straight to the commander, bending over double as he tried to get his breath back. We slowed him down some, but they still have one tank. Shit. I know. Don't waste any time. Let's move to the conquered side and light this baby up. Bowman and the rest climbed the barrier. It had already been doused in gasoline and stood around eight feet tall, stacked with tires, assorted rubbish, trees, branches, and heavy timber beams scavenged from houses in the immediate area. It spanned the entire highway, then snaked into the brush on both sides. Do you want to do the honors? asked Sashi Patel, holding up a match. No way, he told the leader of the small team. You built it, man. You get to have the fun. Patel grinned. Okay. Sweet. It only took one match. Within seconds, the barrier was a raging wall of flames. The fire quickly spread into the trees. They didn't hang around to watch any longer. The heat was intense, and they had their orders to get to the bridge as soon as it was alight. Well, if that's the best they can throw at us, this will be easier than I thought, said President Riley after they gave up the chase and returned to the scene of the ambush. How many did we lose? Orton had been supervising men to drag the dead bodies off to the side of the road. He thought Riley was casual for the benefit of the men. He had seen the shock on his face when the attack had begun and knew he couldn't be happy about the losses they'd sustained. More in a few minutes of fighting than in all the smaller conquests as they swept across New York State over a period of three years. Including the men in the tanks, forty-four dead. Two tanks out of commission and ten horses killed. A shame to lose the tanks, but we still have one. They have none. Hurry the men up. I want to move out. A shout from one of the men interrupted him. 
He looked across to the group doing the last of the cleanup and saw them pointing to the east. A dark column of smoke was rising into the clear blue sky. Even in the few seconds he watched, it grew rapidly. What are they up to? said Orton. We'll soon find out, said Riley. Come on, we're moving out. Within ten minutes they were on the move again, the lone tank leading. This time they left the Mercedes behind. Riley decided it made them an easy target. He had already swapped his suit for the black uniform of a dead soldier. The kid had been shot through the eye, and there was only a little blood on the collar. He and Orton went on foot with the other men while the remaining horses brought up the rear. As they marched along the Franklin Pierce Highway, the smoke in the distance thickened and spread until it was covering half the eastern horizon. I think they set a brush fire. That they did, William, said Riley, a dangerous glint in his eyes. Clever, but the thing about fires is they go out. Within two hours of igniting the barrier, Bowman led the remains of his team and Patel's across the Contacook and joined Colonel Randall and his small army. The colonel led him into the command tent. "'What's the sit, Rep?' Randall asked as his lieutenant enjoyed a well-earned bottle of water. Bowman gave him a rundown of the ambush and their escape. "'Damn it. I was hoping we'd have no tanks to worry about. That changes things a little. But at least you gave them a bloody nose. Did you salvage the RPGs?' "'We have two. Our third man was shot in the head, and we left it when we retreated.' Randall nodded. We'll need to make use of them again, and make sure they are front and center when that convoy arrives. Come on, let's go and give these troops a pep talk. 28. The Concord contingent had managed to fight off the surprise attack of the New Americans and turn their battle into one of attrition, killing two New Americans for every Concord man they managed to take down. They were ensconced on the bridge, managing to get behind the barriers that were supposed to protect them from an attack coming from the other direction, and pinning the invaders down in the valley between buildings that led up to the bridge. Still, they were outnumbered, and their leader, Lippmann, knew before long they would be defeated, even as the casualties on the other side mounted. The hundred from the tower hit the rear of the new American forces hard and had an immediate impact on the battle. The invaders turned and began to fight as the conquered contingent laid down suppressing fire at their backs. Luke and Isaac and the others with firearms speared the charge, shooting as they went. Luke screamed his battle cry, shooting and swinging his vicious hook as he went. He was indiscriminate, shooting and gashing anyone within sight or range. Isaac followed, carefully taking down anyone that looked like a threat to his friend. Ben and Diana were alongside them as well, watching out for each other and adding to the tally of new American casualties. The enemy rallied as the second wave of Manchester people began their close-quarters attack with handheld weapons. In the thick of the battle, Isaac saw his people being shot down. Their charge had the desired effect, though. The enemy was in disarray, sandwiched between two smaller forces— the well-trained conquered soldiers took advantage of the situation and jumped the barriers, charging from their position to hit the new Americans with close-range fire. Isaac and the rest of his gun-wielders renewed their efforts when they saw the new Americans falling, and he dared to hope they might eke out a victory. That lost any importance for him when he realized Luke was gone, though. He shot a man in the face and strained to see over the heaving bodies. He finally spotted Luke. He could only see his head and his bloody hook rising and falling as he took turns shooting and slicing the enemy. Isaac let off a burst of rounds at the men in front of him and rushed over the fallen bodies to help his friend. A man came at him swinging his empty rifle at Isaac's head like a club. He ducked and put the barrel of his gun against the man's stomach and squeezed the trigger. When he rose, Luke had disappeared again. "'We surrender!' a voice called, and suddenly the black-clad men around them began laying down their arms. Isaac ordered them to drop to their knees with their hands on their heads. He found Luke bent over a man, his chest heaving with recent exertion. It was the leader of the New Americans. He'd been shot through the chest. Luke had a bruised cheek and bloody lip. The dead guy looked worse, his demise at the hands of Luke the obvious reason for the quick capitulation of his troops. After the dust had settled, there were seventy-nine surviving New Americans. The Concord contingent had lost 31 men, 
and another five were suffering bullet wounds. Of the one hundred that Luke and Isaac led into battle, twenty-two had been killed. There were no celebrations. The conquered soldiers collected the enemy's weapons and secured the prisoners in their base while Isaac and his team tended to their dead. As they worked at their gloomy task, they quietly discussed the next steps. It was clear that the key to their survival was the outcome of the Battle of Concord. They had been lucky so far, but there was no way they could fight off another attack. Diana and Ben pulled Isaac, Luke, and the commander of the Concord contingent aside. You should take our remaining people and head to Concord with the soldiers, she said to Isaac. They're going to need every person at their disposal, and together with these guys you can bring at least sixty, all armed now that we have the new Americans' weapons. I was thinking the same, said Luke. The commander nodded his support. I can stay and oversee clearing up the bodies and treatment for the wounded with the rest. Ben, you should go too. Are you sure? Yes, she said taking him by the hand. Go. If we don't win Concord, we're as good as dead. An hour later, their combined group of sixty-two, all armed with guns, headed towards Concord by road in the Mustang, three pickup trucks, a jeep, and two Hummers. When the new American army, led by its sole tank, rolled up to the first roadblock, the air was thick with smoke. Most of the fuel had been exhausted except for tires and larger beams of timber, what remained would smolder for days. The woods to either side were blackened and smoking, but the fire had moved on, leaving a swath of charred devastation. With a kerchief tied around his face, Riley inspected the burnt barrier. "'What are your orders, sir?' asked Orton. Riley didn't waste breath answering him. Instead, he turned to the tank and gestured at the barrier. "'Barge your way through that!' he yelled. Orton spoke into his walkie-talkie, and the tank lurched forward as he and Riley stepped off the road. The tank crunched and pushed its way through the smoking rubble. The items that it didn't move from its path were crushed and compacted onto the road. Within seconds, his men had a way through. It would have been much more difficult to traverse or go around if they'd lost the last tank. "'Tell them to pick up the pace,' said Riley. "'I want this over with.' "'Here they come.' said Bowman an hour later. He stood with Randall in the back of a pickup a hundred yards back from the final roadblock. He handed the colonel his binoculars. The older man was bitterly disappointed they hadn't managed to buy more time. Now they had to hold out for as long as they could to give Lockwood time to implement his plan. The tank moved steadily along the highway, leading the cavalry and infantry. There was no sign of the limo Bowman had mentioned. Get the men with the RPGs ready. The enemy wasn't to be surprised this time, though. Barely two minutes after the tank was sighted, it came to a shuddering halt, still a mile and a half out. As they watched, curiously, its turret turned to face the bridge. Christ, Randall muttered. He hadn't given the new Americans enough credit. They were obviously aware of their gun's range and were going to use it to their advantage. His rocket launchers were as useless as water pistols at that range. Get everyone back from the roadblock, now, yelled the colonel as he climbed down from the pickup. Boom! The orders were barely out of Bowman's mouth when the cannon fired. A second later, the middle part of the barrier exploded. Men and debris flew in every direction as the rest of the men turned and fled. Another boom rang out. This shell struck the road on their side of the barrier. More men flew like rag dolls. Bowman and Randall watched helplessly. We may have to retreat, sir. No, they're just softening us up. We need to hold the line. Bowman opened his mouth to argue, but a third boom drowned him out. This one hit the barrier again. When the dust and smoke cleared, it looked like an old man's smile with two teeth missing. The tank would be able to crash through now without missing a beat. Then they heard the chant. It started quietly, then picked up momentum as thousands of voices joined in. New America, New America, New America. Randall put the binoculars back to his eyes. The tank was moving again, faster this time. And behind it, the horses were trotting. The infantry jogged behind them. Get ready. The first wave is coming. 29. 
Lockwood and Paul intercepted the marauders at the northern limits of Concord. They were a daunting sight. Every man was armed with a gun, and nearly everyone carried a backup weapon. From where he stood, Paul saw axes, modified baseball bats, and swords. While the new Americans wore black uniforms and the Brotherhood their habits, the marauders looked more like warriors from a Mad Max movie. They were painted and tattooed and looked downright mean. Paul knew they would strike fear into anyone they faced. He certainly felt intimidated. Still, their leader, Jared, was friendly and respectful when he spoke with Lockwood. More importantly, he was amenable to the change of plans and heading west instead of down to Concord. Within ten minutes of halting, they were following behind Lockwood and Paul in their Hummer, crossing the Merrimack and heading west where a foreboding pall of smoke painted the horizon. Riley was pleased with the results of the tank's barrage and looked to capitalize quickly. Order them full steam ahead. I want the tank to smash that roadblock. Then the cavalry is to ride through with all guns blazing. Yes, sir, he said and spoke into his walkie-talkie. Personally, Orton would have preferred to fire a few more volleys at them, but Riley, incensed by the ambush that had nearly claimed his life, was keen to push forward. There was no use arguing, and besides, Orton had decided he would use the confusion of battle to make his final move against the President. While he had made a deal with Cyclops, it looked as though the confusion of battle would see the opportunity present itself much sooner. He intended to make sure Riley didn't survive the first ten minutes. Once he was eliminated and the fight turned their way, Orton would continue and conquer Concord before returning triumphantly to Rochester at the head of his army. If by some miracle the Concord rabble turned the tide, well, he could treat with the enemy and present his assassination of the president as evidence of his goodwill. Eshman had made his way slowly from the rear of the column until he was in the third row from the front. Ahead, he could see the President and General Orton near the rear of the tank. Orton spoke into his walkie-talkie, and the tank jerked forward. It wasn't held back to ensure men on foot could keep up this time, and gathered momentum as it sped along the highway headed for the damaged roadblock. Go! yelled the President to the men on horseback, and they spurred their mounts, galloping after the armored vehicle. Eshman, watching with interest, ducked out of sight behind the man in front, when Orton turned to address the men on foot. Forward march, he called. Eshman stepped forward with the other men as they fell in behind Riley and his cruel general. Isaac and company arrived in Concord just as the Brotherhood was getting set for the defense of the city under Saracen's direction. Coupled with the men the colonel had left behind, they numbered five hundred. Do you think you're covered if we head out to back up the colonel? Isaac asked Saracen. Of course, sixty men aren't going to make a difference here, but they might there. Go for it. Isaac conferred with Lippman, the captain who led the contingent that had been stationed in Manchester, and he agreed. Let's do it. The tank hammered across the bridge and crashed through the roadblock in a spray of timber and rubble. The horsemen followed it through, shooting at the men in the distance as soon as they had cleared the debris. The armored vehicle traveled another twenty yards, its operator seemingly intent on running right over the sandbag nests ahead. The two rocket-launched grenades struck it from either side. One hit the turret, blowing it askew, and the other whizzed under the tank and exploded, lifting it two feet into the air before it crashed back to the asphalt and shuddered to a halt. Light him up, yelled Randall, happy that the new Americans had fallen so easily into his trap. The gauntlet of men in the surrounding trees began shooting, and within two minutes, the entire new American cavalry was dead or injured on the road around the tank and beyond. Now for the real fight, said Randall. The battle began in earnest three minutes later, as the infantry of the new American army went head-to-head -head with Randall's smaller fighting force. At the beginning, at least, the fight was even. Randall's men, secreted in the woods, managed to keep the enemy from passing the remnants of the roadblock. Eventually, though, the sheer weight of numbers began to tell. Riley split the first portion of his men into two and had them concentrate their fire on the trees on either side of the highway, while Orton and a smaller group laid down suppressing fire on the men ahead of them. Slowly, as men in the woods fell, the rate of firing from the trees diminished, and Riley called Orton over. 
It's time to send your men through, he said. One charge and we should have them. Orton gave the order. Twenty yards behind them, Eshman decided now was his moment. He slid off to the side as the other men crowded forward and began assembling near the gap for the charge. Eshman lifted his rifle casually, pointing it in Orton's general direction. When the firing began, he would take his shot. Orton slowly stepped back and away from Riley, who was facing the gap in the roadblock. It was time. When the men charged through and the firing began, he would assassinate Riley. On three, charge the enemy, he ordered, slowly pulling the pistol from his pocket. One, two, three, attack! Thirty. Lockwood and Paul had left the Hummer a mile out from the intersection with the Franklin Pierce Highway. They now marched at the head of the Marauders' column with Jared. Smoke was thick in the air, but the fire that was causing it seemed to be well to the west. They paused at the intersection to pour over the map. "'We're here,' said Lockwood, pointing at the map, before gesturing down the highway towards the east. "'The colonel's position is two miles that way.' "'Do you think the invaders have gotten that far?' asked Paul. His question was answered not by Lockwood, but by a distant boom carried on the wind from the same direction. "'It would appear so.' said the older man. Come on, we need to get moving. Fire! ordered Randall. Gunfire erupted around him. The first enemy soldiers through the gap fell quickly, but soon, like ants over a dead carcass, they swarmed through the gap and charged headlong towards them. Eshman watched the men begin running through the roadblock as the inevitable return fire began. Bullets whizzed and whined past his head, but Eshman was now fully focused on the task at hand. He raised his rifle to his eye and aimed between William Orton's shoulder blades. Orton moved closer to Riley and slowly brought his pistol up. He was almost tempted to tap the president on the shoulder, to see his eyes as he realized he was about to be betrayed. He resisted the temptation and pointed it at the back of Riley's head and began to squeeze the trigger. That's when his back exploded in white-hot agony. He fell forward, and even as life fled his body, the last directive from his brain was completed by his hand. The gun fired. President Aidan Riley jerked forward as a bullet hit him in the back under his shoulder. From behind? How? The strength went out of his legs as he puzzled over the question. He fell to his knees and reached around to feel the warm, sticky mess. On leaden legs, he turned and found William Orton face down on the ground, a smoking pistol a few inches away from his outstretched hand and a bullet wound between his shoulders. Bastard! You shot me! He said as he toppled over. Strong hands grabbed him and eased him to the ground. Kneeling over him was Eshman, the sniper Orton had ordered whipped not so long ago. You'll be okay, sir. Just stay down. Lockwood and the others heard the battle before they saw it. Around that bend, he called. Paul ran alongside him, a semi-automatic pistol in his hands as the marauders roared and sprinted around and passed them, rushing headlong into battle. Stick close with me, son, Lockwood told the nervous kid. Don't shoot unless you have to. They heard the clash of bodies and gunshots as they rounded the bend. The marauders had crashed into the tail of the enemy column and had already cut a swath through the panicked and surprised soldiers. Bodies, most of them wearing the black uniform of the new American army, fell everywhere as the marauders relentlessly pushed the enemy force back upon itself. Paul and Lockwood watched, but didn't need to fire their weapons. Randall and his men were forced back from position to position, but for each yard the enemy gained they paid a heavy price. Still, he knew it was only a matter of time before they were overwhelmed. As he looked at the broken and dead bodies of his men scattered across the battlefield, he started to wonder if he shouldn't have taken the deal after all. There was nothing for it now. A white flag meant certain death because they had resisted in the first place. Then, two things happened. 
first, the new Americans on the other side of the roadblock and the length of the bridge began to turn as gunfire and screams rang out from their rear. And second, behind Randall and his men, a posse of vehicles screeched to a halt. There weren't many of them, but Isaac and Luke led an invigorated unit that joined the battle with enthusiasm and began to force the new Americans' vanguard back. Randall's tired men joined in, and their new push, coupled with the trouble behind the enemy's lines, swung the battle back in Concord's favor. Soon they had taken back control of the area behind the roadblock and were picking off the enemy forces on the other side. He didn't dare to call it yet, but somehow, by some miracle, it looked like they might prevail. "'What's happening?' Riley asked, coming to. He had been bandaged and was sitting off to the side, with Eshman standing guard over him. Eshman didn't try to sweeten it. "'We're being attacked on two fronts, sir,' he said. "'A big force from behind is crushing us, and we've lost the ground we gained on the other side of the roadblock. They'll be on us soon. We can't fight our way out of this. I think we should surrender.' The pale-faced president didn't respond to the news. "'You killed General Orton?' To save my life? Eshman thought about being honest and telling Riley he hadn't known that Orton was going to assassinate him. But then, he didn't think it was a lie to claim he had saved his life, even if it wasn't intentional. Yes, sir. Riley reached out and put his hand on the sniper's arm, wincing at the pain in his shoulder. Thank you. Cedar's surrender. I don't want any more to die because of me. You're in command now. Badly wounded, with heavy blood loss, it appeared the fight had gone out of President Aidan Riley. Yes, sir. Eshman stood up and began yelling. We surrender! We surrender! The frightened men and women around him picked up the cry and began laying down their arms. They're surrendering, sir, reported Bowman as the gunfire began to taper off. Randall, bone-tired, looked heavenward and exhaled slowly. Thank God. Two days later, in the Concord City Hall, Colonel Randall, Isaac Race, and a sick but recovering Aidan Riley signed a peace treaty. For the damage and lives they had taken, Riley and New America agreed to pay compensation in the way of goods and labor for two years. Riley also signed the non-aggression pact that, if breached, meant New America would be invaded by the combined forces of Concord, the Brotherhood, and the Marauders, and Aidan Riley put to death. Riley was happy to sign it. He understood very clearly that his execution had been discussed and supported loudly by some during the days after the surrender. As luck would have it, Isaac Race and his contingent had pushed for mercy, and he owed them a debt of gratitude. In the days that he'd been there, and while they debated his future, Isaac, Luke, and Randall had gotten some insight into how Aidan Riley had turned out as he had. He had had it much rougher than any of them, and it was clear the influence of his general, William Orton, hadn't been helpful. In some respects, he was a victim of circumstance, but then again, they all were. You know... All I ever wanted was to put America back together again, said Riley, as he was climbing into his damaged but still running Mercedes. Eshman sat in the driver's seat. Maybe this is the beginning of that. I'm sorry I didn't try another way to start with. In the end, he'd taken full responsibility, and they'd all agreed that the last president's son was not a lost cause— and that some good would actually come of the Battle of Concord. The last act of the peace accords was an agreement to form a council between all five cities to begin working on trade and mutual assistance between the members. The council was to meet every six months and would include setting a framework for military cooperation in case of another threat arising. No one named them, but everyone knew that was likely to come from the Chinese occupiers if they ever came back across the Mississippi. Maybe he's right, said Luke, as they watched the car turn and head back out of Concord. Maybe today is the rebirth of America. 
Randall put his hand on Luke's shoulder. I hope so, son. I hope so. Epilogue I pitched the ball. Max struck it clean and it flew over Luke's head. He turned and began sprinting after the ball even as Becky made a beeline for it. Run, Max! called Indigo as she sprinted from second to third base. Cade was already headed for home. Becky and Luke ended up in a huddle wrestling over the ball as Aaron, standing in the bleachers of the small park, jumped up and down next to his sister, squealing in delight. In the end, the ball rolled free, much to the disgust of their teammate Sam, who retrieved it. Get a room, you two, I yelled from the mound. We have a game to win. Cade passed home base as Sam threw the ball, and Indigo slipped home while it was still in the air. Diana, who was playing catcher, dragged in the catch and rushed to the plate as my boy steamed home. With an almighty slide, he beat her to it. The gangly eight-year-old's victory dance was a sight to behold, and my team lined up to congratulate him and the other winners with high fives and claps on the back. We had a picnic on the grass after the game. Indigo and I, Ben and Diana, and Luke and Becky watched the kids playing together. Ben and Diana's three-year-old, Blake, played with his cousin Aaron and her raven-haired little sister Elizabeth, who had just turned two. The bigger kids played some catch. I still can't get over how much she looks like you, Indigo said to Becky as they watched the girls. Her good looks, my smarts, piped up Luke. We greeted this with the groans it deserved. Seriously, though, said Luke, taking a sip of cold lemonade. Does it get any better than this? Things had changed markedly since the battle for Concord. The spirit of cooperation between the signatories after the battle had continued, and we now had a healthy, loose collaboration between settlements. Concord and Manchester, along with Rochester, were growing quickly as word of the cities and the lifestyles they could offer spread. Aidan Riley came to understand it was possible to grow without conquest, and when he died tragically of a blood clot on the brain at the age of only 24, President Eshman had continued his good work. Colonel Randall stepped down as leader of Concord a year ago, saying it was time for democracy to begin again. Their first election was won by Daniel Bowman, who became governor in a landslide. He immediately appointed Colonel Randall as his senior advisor. The marauders and the people of Ashland began migrating to Concord and Manchester as soon as the accords had been signed. Word had spread quickly about the comfort and safety that the cities had to offer. Their army blended with Randall's and despite some teething problems had settled in nicely. Their leader, Jared, was appointed general after Bowman won the role of governor. He had proven himself an extremely capable leader in the few years since the battle. The Chinese in the West were always a consideration. But whether it was because of fear of the virus or superstition or just plain indifference, they had never crossed the Mississippi in the intervening years as far as anyone knew. Randall believed if they left the Chinese alone, they in turn would leave the survivors in the East alone. I hoped he was right. I also worried. Worried that the bigger and more sophisticated we got, the more of a curiosity or threat we might become to them. Hopefully, that was a long way off. For now, it was time to enjoy the present. You know what, Luke? I said. I don't think so. I don't think it does get any better than this. The End of Episode 6 You have been listening to Civil War, Episode 6 of the America Falls series. Written by Scott Medbury. Narrated by by Adam Barr. Don't miss the next America Falls adventure, Lone Wolf. Hi, everyone. This is Adam Barr with a word from Scott. Hi, everyone. It's Scott here. I hope you enjoyed the final installment of Civil War. That wraps up this story arc of America Falls, and I want to thank you all for coming along with Isaac, Luke, and the rest of the group. I hope you had as many laughs, thrills, and tears as I did writing their adventures. America Falls does continue with Lone Wolf, and there's also Messenger, a short story coming after that one. I hope you'll stick with me for those, and I'm also keen to see what you think of my other audiobooks as they land on YouTube. 
I really want to thank you all for your comments and support. And I promise I'm not done with Isaac, Luke and co just yet. But there's some stuff to do in between. Lastly, you'd be doing me a massive favour by liking and subscribing and also sharing America Falls with your family and friends. Thanks again, Scott.